which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the October 15th Post Falls City Council meeting. And uh, Rhiannon, please note that all council members are present. And it gives me an opportunity to introduce Rhiannon O'Neill, our new executive assistant slash deputy uh, city clerk. And I just pretty much call her boss because <laughs> Deborah did a great job uh, for almost six years of keeping, my, keeping me straight, telling me where I needed to be and not oftentimes where to go, but where I needed to be. And now <laughs> Rhiannon has stepped in and between her and Shannon, uh, they, they keep good track of me, so I really appreciate her help, and this is your first council meeting, so welcome. Thank you. We did start the evening with a workshop on snow plowing, so it's October and the weather feels like we could see snow, so more information to come on that. We do have a few announcements tonight, um, and we've got a proclamation that I would usually read during announcement, but uh, those folks are right now at the Coeur d'Alene City Council getting a proclamation read and then they're gonna run out here. So I'm gonna save that for mayor comments. Residential fall cleanup is Saturday, October 26th. Pick, pickup will be one day citywide. Items must be placed at the street by 6.30 a.m. All items are to be bagged, bundled, or in a garbage cart. Items must not exceed four feet in length and four feet in width. Furniture, tires, concrete, brick, or hazardous materials will not be picked up. Appliances will be picked up by appointments only, excluding refrigerators and air conditioners. If you have questions, call City of Post Falls, 777-4504, or Post Falls Sanitation, 457-1820. Trick or treat at City Hall is Thursday, October 31st, from 2 uh, through 4.30 p.m. Daylight, saving, daylight savings time ends on the first Sunday in November, November 3rd and you'll set your clocks back one hour. Election day will be Tuesday, November 5th. There is a city council election on the ballot. City hall will not be a polling place. And then I will be giving my state of the city address at the chamber at uh, Chamber of Commerce Connect for lunch at noon on Tuesday, November 5th. And we do have uh, some police department awards. Chief. Well, good evening, Mayor, Council, uh, Chief Knight. Uh, happy to be here and honored to be here. I'll have Captain Mueller come up and join me this evening, but uh, excited to give out three awards this evening to three of our staff members who are doing uh, some fantastic work out in our community. So if I could have uh, Christopher, Chris, come, come forward, Christensen. We have Christopher Morizumi, please come forward, and Lucas Krieger. Come <coughs> On November 15, 2011, the City of Post Falls Police Department established the Life Saving Award, which is presented to department members that have distinguished themselves by performing or reacting to a life-threatening situation in a positive and professional manner. The member's reaction to the situation must have saved or substantially prolonged the life of another person, existing with the strong possibility that if action was not taken, loss of life or critical injury to another person would have occurred. On October 6, 2018, at approximately 23.55 hours, officers responded to a report of a suicide attempt where a male had hung himself and was currently unconscious, not breathing, and purple in color. Officers arrived on scene to find that the male's girlfriend had already cut him down from the rope and initiated CPR. <clears throat> Officer Christensen retrieved a defibrillator from his patrol vehicle while Officer Morizumi started administering CPR. Officer Krieger assisted with situating the male and getting him ready for the application of the defibrillator. Officer Christensen came back and immediately applied the defibrillator and rotated cycles of CPR with Officer Morizumi until Kootenai County Fire and Rescue arrived on scene and took over life-saving measures. <clears throat> when Kootenai County Fire and Rescue transported the male to Kootenai Health, he was breathing on his own and had a pulse. Through follow-up, we have learned that the male has made a full recovery with no long-term effects stemming from the incident. It is without a doubt that with quick without the quick response and skilled life-saving efforts from these officers, <clears throat> is why the man is still alive today and able to get the kind of help needed to manage his depression. These officers are truly a credit to this department. Respectfully to myself, Chief Knight. 
Tonight we're going to honor two of the officers. As you know, we have an awards committee, and uh, when these things are uh, sent into the awards committee, the awards committee makes the determination of what awards will be uh, issued out, if any, and uh, when given to the officers. So we'll present two life-saving awards this evening and one distinguished service award. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. You make our city proud. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. I feel safer already. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Always nice to, nice to be able to start a meeting with uh, that kind of presentation. Thanks, Chief. Captain, for, for bringing those folks forward. Are there any amendments to the agenda tonight? We have none tonight, sir. Are there any declarations of conflict? Seeing none, would you please present the consent calendar? Item A is minutes September 25th, 2019 City Council Workshop. Item B is minutes October 1st, 2019 City Council Meeting. Item C is payable September 24th through October 7th, 2019. Item D is contract with Fairway Floors for installation of flooring at Black Bay Depot. Item E is reasoned decision for the Ruby Springs annexation. Item F is reasoned decision for the <coughs> Savory annexation. Item G is a Vista Power Line easement, City of Post Falls land application site. And H is Green Meadows Subdivision Construction Improvement Agreement. Any questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Move to <coughs> approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. second. Motion second. Further discussion? Rhiannon, please take the roll. Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next up is uh, public hearings. Tonight we have none. Unfinished business. Black Bay Consulting Service Agreement for Park Design Validation and Schematic. Right. Good evening, Mayor and Council Brian Myers, Parks Manager, City of Post Falls. Uh, tonight, before you uh, and in your packet, is a consulting services agreement for park design validation and schematic design for Black Bay Park. Uh, as you know, um, this has been about a year-long process to get to the point where we're at right now and beginning to move design for, uh, farther along. Uh, we came to you for the first time in August 7th uh, requesting for an RFP to go out. Um, to look for consulting firms to come up with a new vision plan for Black Bay Park. Uh, with that, uh, in October, we contracted with Civitas, um, and over the next eight months, 10 months, uh, we worked with them to develop a, a vision plan for that space. All throughout uh, numerous community interactions, um, we had a steering committee consisting of Park and Rec Commission members and a couple of uh, council members as well as well as uh, a couple of citizens at large. That overall plan uh, was brought back and adopted by yourselves at the August 6th meeting. Um, that plan overarching uh, outlined uh, a strategy to activate the park uh, with these kind of guiding principles and everything that we're testing, um, testing those design standards against, preserving while enhancing, uh, making sure that the natural environment that's there within Black Bay is retained and uh, enhanced and allow folks to circulate throughout it uh, and be able to activate the space and allow staff to more easily maintain and patrol the facility. Place the park in motion through a system of trails and ensuring that we have good quality access throughout to the varied, desti uh, varied destinations in the park. Uh, activate without overpowering, so ensuring that those 
changes we do make to the space aren't harsh, aren't uh, in opposition to the natural space that, that we have out there. Providing a park for everyone, providing a space that allows all age levels, um, all demographics to be able to, to engage in the space and have access to their park and their bay. And lastly, engaging the bay, engaging the water line and ensuring that we do provide that access uh, to the water. Black Bay is the furthest uh, park we have downstream uh, that, that's seasonally open through the winter months. As you know, we, we have our rivers regulated by the dam and once we hit the uh, spring flush and the, the dam opens up with the spill gates, we have to close down that section of the river below the bridge and Black Bay is that one space where we still have access and can have folks moving about on the riverway. The overall plan uh, you see here on the screen um, outlines a, a pretty grand plan, much gra more grand than I think any of us had in, by, in mind when we first started out. And this was largely driven by those public outreach uh, meetings that we had with the public. Uh, and this plan is definitely of our community. Um, and those, that, that motion of being of the community went all the way to that, that adoption week. Uh, where we still were making modifications to that, that shoreline structure to try to meet the needs of the surrounding neighbors. The overall was outlined in four major phases, um, which I won't go over at this point because we have discussed this at length. The current scope that's before you uh, outlines a community outreach strategy to take us through this next phase of design for, from design validation through schematic design. The design validation piece is basically working with the regulatory agencies that we will, that I'll mention later on, um, working with the, the public overall and staff to ensure that we're moving forward uh, phase one elements that are making the best use of the dollar early on and providing uh, the biggest impact we can for the dollars that we're gonna utilize. Uh, the schematic design piece, will still be interacting with the public and, and moving that piece forward as we work through there. Uh, but mostly that's starting to boil this down into something that's actually constructible. And then the <coughs> permitting agency coordination, that'll be weaved in and out throughout this entire, entire process. Um, the community out, outreach strategy, once again, will continue moving forward with the, the steering committee that was in place at the initial part of this, of this design. So we have some continuation there. We'll continue to have uh, open public community meetings and we'll continue to have updates to Park and Rec Commission and, and yourselves um, as we move through the, throughout the, the next phases of design. Design validation, um, once again, this is exploring that, that phasing strategy in more detail. In particular, the parking lot improvements, how much of those do we wanna move forward right now? Um, that was a pretty big ticket item within phase one, uh, removing the existing parking lot and relocating that along third. Is that the right time for us right now? Um, extent of phase one, the boardwalk community docks, how big is that gonna be? Largely gonna be triggered off of our permit uh, coordination that, that we're gonna be going, undergoing on this. And then the trail phasing strategy um, and just phasing strategy in general. Uh, <coughs> one of the deliverables they have to us in this st stage is a scope of work for survey and geotechnical um, services. So right now, as we went through and we're trying to scope this, there's a lot of unknowns. We don't exactly know the geographic area that we're going to have to impact. As that becomes more known through those other, through those other processes, the consultant will be able to draw up a scope that we can present to a survey crew, and then that becomes more tangible for our consultants to provide design cost estimates for bringing this to full construction. The schematic design piece, um, this is where we start to really get materiality and the textures and the plant palette that we're gonna be utilizing at the, at the park. Um, so beginning of site grading will be included in this design, um, at this level of design. When we're at the vision plan in the initial part of this design, everything's a little bit um, broad strokes. We don't have a lot of the fine detail and the schematic design process is gonna boil that down so 
we're actually putting dollars to this bench versus this bench versus this bench so we can actually start to build this out and know what it's going to cost to, to overall deliver this park. And then ongoing permit coordination is going to be continuing through this phase. Overall, uh, we're sitting at about 20 weeks for these two phases, schematic design being eight weeks of that. Um, permit coordination, that task, uh, we anticipate having to have permits through US Army, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Idaho Department of Water Resources, Idaho Department of Lands, uh, Idaho DEQ, and Avista will also be at the table in that, although that they probably won't be a regulating body, um, they're certainly involved <coughs> because it touches one of the waterways that uh, their dam impacts, uh, both from a generation perspective and the recreation component. And they've been a big partner for us up, up until this point, and we want to continue that down that thread wherever possible. We anticipate that being 12 meetings, so pretty extensive just on the permit coordination piece to be able to move this project forward. Uh, already gave you an overview of that schedule. Um, as that wraps up, uh, we're I guess kind of midpoint through that, we'll be coming back to you with a uh, contract for survey and geotech services. And then we'll be moving later on with final design development and construct construction documentation um, any final permitting requirements that may come out of, out in the wash as we move through this process will be known at that point. And then we're going to be going through the process of trying to secure funding through grants and other ways, uh, and then moving on to construction. Overall de detailed fee breakdown for this project, uh, or this phase of the project, task one, the design validation is 47,000, schematic design components of this, 38,500 and then the permitting tasks is $10,000. There are some reimbursable expenses and travel expenses related to uh, the consultant and overall design fee at $106,500. Um, so our request before you today is to approve the consulting services agreement with Civitas um, for landscape architecture services at Black Bay. And Brian, the funding comes out of impact fees? Correct. <clears throat> the funding source is impact fees on this project. Questions about Carrie. I have a question um, on the travel expenses, like $9,500. I'm just curious. So, this is a Denver company that has taken the work here in Post Falls, Idaho. Why, is, why are we, whether it's impact fees or however it is, why are we paying? I would think that would be a cost of them doing business outside of Denver. It's, it's just the way they structured that fee breakdown. You know, they, they could have lumped it into their, their overall and put it in as overhead, but um, it's just the way they, they chose to outline that. Uh, we've, we've experienced that with our Park and Rec master plan and other plans. Even if we have a firm out of Spokane, we'll see that as a line item where they'll have travel-related expenditures and... Um, reimbursables listed so not uncommon there's there's quite a few visits on this on this visit or on this scope um, flights out of Denver are not terribly expensive but you know. that's Steve go for it's just fine. in our last meeting that we had with Civitas when he put prices to the park they were all very general compared to on prior project they maybe had in Denver or other areas. Will this give us more reasonable updated costs on it? Once they're done with it, they'll have, have it nailed pretty close to what the final cost will be. It'll definitely be much closer. Um, at the earlier phase, you know, we can, you can change varying types of wood and it will drastically impact that deliverable on that, that boardwalk facility. So as we work through that schematic design piece and we choose what that exact construction is going to look like, we'll start to see real numbers or we're closer to real numbers. Um, granted, we're still gonna be a little ways out from construction, so we'll have some cost escalators in there with date of construction versus date of design. But, but you should have enough to be able to go out to bid? Go out to bid or definitely go out for grants to start Fund. to seek grant funding. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, I know it's kind of late in the game, but <clears throat> my only concern is the scope of this 
whole project. I mean, we're paying over $100,000 for a design that probably isn't going to get built out for several years, maybe even like 10 or 20 years. <coughs> My concern is that we're going to have a plan there that is probably going to have to change. Is there a better way to do this? I mean, to have one part of it designed first and then see how things all settle out and build out and then design on top of that? Or sure. do we really need to do this whole all-in-one thing that may not ever get built the way? <clears throat> I think that we're on the same page with the approach we're taking with this. So largely, we're doing that vision testing piece. So we're dialing ourselves in so when we scope that geotech and the survey, we have a more known quantity of what we're going to actually be doing final design on. The schematic piece, we anticipate that most of that work will carry throughout each of those design phases. There might be slight little updates, slight little tweaks that'll happen in later phases, but when you start to detail out how a bench goes in the ground with this project, that will be the same bench that goes in the ground with each of the following phases. So we have some uniformity across the whole park. So by going with the design validation and the schematic design with this contract, we kind of narrowed down enough that we are able to carry these dollars through the later phases of design, mm -hmm. rather than go into full detail design, full construction documents with the first phase, and maybe have to throw some of that out because it only fits with phase one. Oh, so okay. That was kind of the, the mindset that we had in structuring a, in the, the agreement this way with them. Okay. Brian, does this also affect our ability on grants that you have to have the, some of the design work scoped ahead? It does. You definitely need to have some solid figures as far as the cost. Um, the more public interaction you have, the more touch points you have with the community throughout a design process, the more competitive we're going to be on that scoring item as we go out and look for those grant funding items. So by doing this this way, we're going to leverage those dollars in that way to, to help find outside partners to actually build this. Um, so I don't know if that fully answered your question, but. I think so, yes. I did. Steve? Hi, right, well, okay. I think one uh, key to the success of this will be the permits from all the <clears throat> different agencies. Is the city going to be the lead agency on the permitting process with Civitas giving you the backup information for that? or? Is, Civitas going to be the main people meeting with the... Civitas is the lead, and they're bringing on a consulting, uh, a subconsultant with TO engineers for this phase because TO has got a lot of experience on the Spokane River. When they reached out to them, um, they felt really, really confident that they have a good pulse on what's going to be required and had some good strategies to how to help begin to navigate that process in those conversations. Dave Fair, Park and Rec Director. Uh, I think to play upon that, one of the things that we're looking at is if we have to go to the Corps of Engineers, a 404 <coughs> permit, very extensive. I dealt with that back in Skagit County years ago, back when I had darker hair and gray matter that could remember all those things. So part of this permitting is we pulled it back instead of just going full board was to try and reduce that, because we don't want to get into a project that says we have to go into that extensive of permitting where it takes a specialist. We will do as much as we can in-house. A uh, number of us have worked through the permitting on those sides of it. Um, but depending on where this lays out, we may have to have that uh, company that has those connections. So hopefully that answers The it. technical detail. Yeah. On it. We know our limits of our ability so we'll do what we can but at some points it's better for us to contract out okay thank you Linda? um well i i guess how i feel about the situation is we've come this far i was publicly against the dock going out into the river but if the parks department feels like this is the best way to go i feel like the city hires these people and they have the expertise. So I, it looks like it's an action item and you need a motion. Yes, and I would move to approve the Black Bay Park Consulting Services Agreement for park design validation and schematic design. Second. Motion second, further discussion. 
<coughs> Roll call, please. Borders. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Anthony. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next item on the agenda is citizens issues and this section of the agenda is reserved for citizens wishing to address the council regarding a city related issue that is not on the agenda. Chief. Mayor and council for the record my name is Warren Merritt I'm the fire chief with KCFR. I'd like to add on a couple of comments and first congratulate the officers that have been engaged in the, in the life saving activity. I was penciling down and remembering about six or seven years ago when uh, Chief <coughs> Hogue was here and we gave five AEDs to, to the police department and under the continued leadership of Chief Knight and the Post Falls Police, we're a proud partner today and now they have an AED in every patrol car. So it is a, a very uh, worthy investment um, and the partnership we have with the City of Post Falls Police Department is second to none in terms of delivering emergency services within the city here. So we're, we're real proud of that. The other thing I wanted to add on tonight too was um, on November 3rd, when you uh, change your clocks, please check your batteries um, and, and, and in your smoke detectors. Uh, and to know that there are 10-year batteries out there now that have a lithium battery. So um, each battery has a birthday. And so if it's more than 10 years old, it's time to replace it. And then at the council, um, I'm sure they're aware of this, but I shared this with the city staff last week that we were able to obtain a, a, about a $1.1 million safer grant. Um, this is going to allow us now to hire six additional firefighters at Kootenai Fire and Rescue. So we're rapidly in the hiring mode and expect to have an academy on or about the first of the year. Um, this is going to offset 75% uh, of the costs uh, for the first two years for those six individuals and then 35% and then of the cost for the next three years. And then we anticipate uh, continuing the funding of those, of, of those members uh, once the URDs begin to close. So this is um, adding a third person to the heavy fire apparatus. And what that does is it allows a team of three to be on each of those every single day. There are times now when we only have two on an engine company. And when you uh, get to a house fire and there's potentially somebody trapped, this allows us to enter the structure, extend a hose line, do a search and rescue, and put the fire out all at the same time. So this is a matter of efficiency, uh, both in terms of the fire ground, but it also adds to our ability uh, when we're in the most complex uh, EMS or rescue calls as well. As you know, the police department responds when we have CPR calls, and really they go to all the calls of this, which is cool. But on the most critical calls, um, they lend a hand in first aid and, and do CPR. And so this allows us to do what they call um, rapid sequence, or, or rather that we can do rapid CPR. And so we rotate out every minute or so or every 100 compressions. And they're part of that team. Well, this gives us one more firefighter that adds to that ability as well. Um, there is direct links between um, the sequence of CPR and survivability from out of hospital cardiac arrest. So it's a very important um, that we maintain that. And so this additional staffing allows us to be more efficient and more importantly it allows us our firefighters that are on the fire trucks to be more safe as well so just want to share that bit of good news and uh, thanks for give, giving me a few minutes at the podium thanks chief we appreciate the working relationship city has with Kootenai county fire and rescue anyone else seeing none the next item on the agenda is new business first is a mobile vending ordinance jamie Well, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Jamie Hayes. I'm a planner with the Community Development Department, and I'm here to present the Mobile Vending Ordinance, which would be Chapter 5.30. Mobile vending is a rapidly growing industry with garnering about 7% growth in the last five years. It's a multi-billion dollar industry throughout the United States. Um, as you probably know, there's two in Coeur d'Alene. We have them um, in Liberty Lake, Spokane, and sometimes on my way to work, I can count up to three that I pass just to get to work here. Um, having an established code will assist staff with how to address vendors. The ordinance is intended to outline policy that gives small business owners guidance within the city limits that also complements the general health, safety, and welfare of our community. I'm gonna go over different types of permitted vending, operating requirements, permitting vending sites, and enforcement. We're gonna generally talk about two different types of vendors. First, we're gonna talk about sidewalk vendors and push carts. Um, they're defined as mobile food vending units where food is sold from or out of a non-motorized cart, bicycle, or other mobile piece of equipment that is not designed to be towed <coughs> by a motor vehicle and is readily movable. Um, when operating on private property, they're going to be required to have permission from the property owner. 
and they cannot be positioned in a way that reduces parking, the required amount of parking stalls, um, public streets, landscaped areas, fire uh, lanes, or swales. Um, they must be self-contained and cannot use outside water or sewer. They must maintain a four-foot pedestrian path when um, vending on city sidewalks. And they are required to retain, maintain uh, setbacks such as fire hydrant setbacks, ADA stalls, and ramp setbacks. There's a full list in your staff report. The other type of mobile vendors that we're talking about is the actual ones on, on wheels that you would have to, they're motorized or they're towed with trailers, they're capable, be, capable of being readily moved, and they're designed and equipped to prepare and safely store and serve food, including cooked fair, food, food prepared from commissaries, or readily packaged and readily to, um, available to eat foods. Um, they may be mobile or hosted as a full-time semi-stationary site as what this picture is depicting. They must be self-contained and cannot use outside water or sewer unless the unit is parked at a mobile vending site that offers approved utility connections such as this. In a situation such as this, they would also be required to go through the full site plan review process as well. And when on private property on a regular basis, they must be, li be licensed from a mobile vending site. Vendors operating on private property must also have written permission from the property owner and they will also need to maintain at least two additional parking stalls meeting city requirements per vending unit. The street vending unit cannot be parked or placed in a manner that reduces the number of parking stalls, swales, maneuvering aisles, fire lanes, etc. And for the sites, all units must be able to be readily moved. They must have the City of Post Falls business license um, displayed in plain view. They can only serve up walk up, they can only serve walk up customers. They cannot obstruct sidewalks, streets, alleys, or any public spaces in any matter. They're limited to selling food, beverages, and limited promotional items, and they must maintain a clean environment with adequate waste receptacles. The signage must also be professional and pertinent to the vendor, and waste water must be disposed of at an approved site equipped with a grease trap. And all units must be equipped with a backflow device to prevent any water contamination. As far as enforcement, operation of any mobile site um, that is found to be in violation of the ordinance would be fined up, would, I'm sorry, would be, um, their license would be revoked and then they would have to wait two years before being able to apply again. And in the first instance of, instance of operating a mobile unit or a mobile site without a license, there will be a $100 fine. A second instance of operating without the required license within a two year period is an infraction of $300 and all additional violations within a two-year period is a misdemeanor, each constituting a separate violation for per day that it's accrued. Um, all mobile vending sites must meet the requirements of Panhandle Health and Kootenai County Fire and Rescue. And do you have any questions, comments, inputs? Jamie, we have, you know, I see the one on Spokane Street. Do we have very many mobile vending units out here? Um, well, I know I pass one on Ple two on Pleasant View. We have one on Spokane Street. Um, personally, I've fielded numerous um, calls and inquiries about it. Um, I've also had two people come in and want to basically come on work for me here. Um, do sites such as this? I was going to ask you that if you've had any inquiries as to a yeah, I've had two. Um, one down here and one across from the hospital on on Mullen. They're they're just inquiries. People are curious about it. It's a really popular thing. I mean, I was just down at the park in a different city, and there's hot dog vendors, and I think it's a really common thing that is. It might be unavoidable that they're coming in, but I think that this just maintains a, a safe way to deal with it. So we have quality products when we drive by it looks nice it looks clean you know this is similar to what Hayden just approved is it not this is the uh, the uh, prairie pavilion mm -hmm. yeah this is actually at 11 15 in the morning and you can see all those people lined up mm -hmm. I was a little bit surprised by the uh, diversity of people and that people were there so early okay. it was a beautiful day though Steve I know Jamie the uh, Parks Department has a, their own policy mm -hmm. as far as uh, mobile vendors for their activities this ordinance doesn't affect the parks oh. policy events so there no two separate entities okay, basically good. yes and I got a second question 
does this affect at all the little the little ice cream trucks that go around town that have been going on? Forever? No, kind of a stupid no, question, I mean, but no, it's not a stupid question, <laughs> not at all. I mean, I think that forever, I think that know. that's a great question because that's that's definitely part of it. And so, no, it wouldn't affect them in any adverse way. I mean, <clears throat> okay. I think that from the ordinance that you have, I think that we require you know besides the people that are selling ice cream with their music going, that we yeah. kind of limit the distance of how far you're going to be able to hear their music. But as far as ice cream. Vendors, no. They're, good. They're yeah. really mobile vendors. They are truly <laughs> mobile vendors, yeah. And this, you know, then this does kind of cover all three versions of it. You know, you have the sidewalk vendor, the one that is rolling around going site to site, and then the semi permanent ones like this that, you know, obviously have to be readily moved if needed. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Jamie, I got a couple of questions too. One being, did we get any input from existing businesses that would be affected by? You know, vendors. you know what I got um, input from is I actually got input from vendors. You know, the curious thing about mobile vending to me is that a lot of these small business owners start out just like this. They can't afford the brick and mortar. And then they get really, they have enough money, they've garnered enough money through experience, people, they're popular enough that they do actually set up a brick and mortar. The Bunker Bar came from the Coeur d'Alene um, area, the Bunker Burgers, I should say. He came in, he talked to me, he was curious about a site, he found a site, they were popular enough that they bought that bought that place on Spokane right there, and now they're running a business in, in Post Falls. Okay. My second question was the this new policy. Is it consistent with what we see in like Coeur d'Alene and Hayden, so that a vendor doesn't have to jump through a whole different set of hoops here than they do someplace else? I think that the the ordinance that has been drafted collaboratively with city staff is a fairly straightforward easy to get through ordinance that was that was the intent of it yes okay. i would say less tedious in fact okay okay sure. thank you mm -hmm. so my question is when i went through there if it's there i just didn't see it and okay. i thought i was reading for comprehension okay, okay let me get prepared. Uh, the permit fee the the permit fee is going to be a standard business license fee okay and then that is good for a year a year okay Lynn? Jamie, who's going to enforce this? I, well, I have concern just, just about like the technicalities that you've got in this plan, grease traps, um, the sanitation part of things. Uh, that really kind of falls to the health department regulations. I've, and I've worked extensively with the Panhandle Health on this. Um, they were very, their response to me was very grateful for <laughs> covering as many items. She said that no one had covered as many items and had gotten down to the root of it like ours that we had drafted for um, for this. Um, and, it, and it is a collaborative effort. They would be working with these mobile vendor, vendors will be working with Kootenai County Fire Department. They, that's part of it. They will be having to go through Panhandle Health and then us. It's a collaborative effort. But from the city standpoint, mm -hmm. who's going to enforce this ordinance? I, w I would say that just like any ordinance that we have, there is some extent of community and and people driving by and just you know like it's a group effort for that one as well i mean when you have a nuisance you have it called in uh, i don't think that these people are trying to come in and and the last thing they want to do is sell something that's going to get somebody sick that could definitely be the the demise of, of that business so Councilor Borders, if I might, this is largely going to be driven out of a community development. Um, there are pieces of this that will touch public works as well. Um, you mentioned the grease traps. That's, that's a real issue that we run into occasionally with people draining their, <laughs> their water into storm swales and, and cloud, uh, essentially plugging up our dry wells. Um, much of this we've tried to keep it as easy to enforce as possible. For instance, on the on the um, grease trap, we want to know where they're disposing of their, their gray water. That's essentially what we're asking is, tell us where you're going to dispose of this so we can make sure that they're set up to handle this. If you tell us that you've got an approved site, we would look at it and it's approved, you're good to go. It's not going to take, hopefully, a lot of time. There is, a, frankly, a dearth of areas where you can dispose of that type of water. I mean, your typical RV dump isn't set up to handle grease. So it's, it's going to be an interesting um 
thing to get over, but that's not unique to us. Other cities have the same same concerns and same requirements. Okay. Okay, Lynn. Yeah, Linda. And Jamie, you're just looking for us to make a motion to bring back an ordinance, correct? Correct, and to see if you have any input or any amendments you want to see anything. Any additional comments? Well, I would make a motion to um, move that we have staff bring back an ordinance for approval of the mobile vending. Second. Motion second. Further discussion. Brianna, please take the roll. Thorson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Anthony. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Borders. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Next item up under new business is the resolution to endorse the City of Post Falls pre-treatment plan. That's right. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Craig Bornpel, Utilities Manager for the City of Post Falls. Um, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about uh, an endorsement um, of our pre-treatment program for the City of Post Falls and uh, a resolution. Um, so our Public Works Director, John Beecham, presented to you in March on uh, pre-treatment, gave a good background uh, of the issues. I'm not gonna rehash that, that whole presentation, but we're available if um, there's general questions about <coughs> industrial pre-treatment. Um, or any of the aspects uh, related to the program. Um, what I'll do is just maybe give you a little bit of an update on our application and then uh, um, present what we're looking for tonight. Uh, so as we are preparing our application to implement the industrial pretreatment program, um, several documents required updating. Uh, we have done that and they are complete and ready for submittal. Um, Rathdrum was obligated to enact a similar sewer use ordinance to ours. Um, they approved that um, last week at their council meeting, so that's ready to go. And as we were compiling all the information for our application, we identified a need for a statement of endorsement of the program um, as part of the, the federal regulations. So the uh, federal regulations basically indicates that uh, the submission shall include a statement reflecting the endorsement or approval of the local boards or bodies responsible for supervising and or funding the publicly owned treatment works pretreatment program if approved. So that is you. Uh, so with the help of uh, uh, staff members, we fashioned that into a resolution, um, which is further down on the agenda. So this isn't an action item, but I did want to present it and, and stand for questions that you may have related to the resolution uh, before you get to that on the agenda. So it's something we're doing now, but we just need to have an endorsement to provide to the proper <laughs> governmental agency to say that we're doing it. We're doing it. You said it much better than I could. If you want, <laughs> you want this, uh, this spot, I'll let you take it. No, thank you. <laughs> That's the extent of what I would know about <laughs> pre-treatment. Yeah. Any comments, thoughts, input? Got to have it. Yeah. Thank you for your time. So we need a motion to... That's coming up. No, no yeah. motion oh, at this point. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Are we ever going to be done with the wastewater stuff? <laughs> no. As soon as people stop flushing. <laughs> Job security. Job yeah, that's. Uh, Find a commodity everybody needs. <laughs> next item up is the uh, ordinances and resolutions, and we have two resolutions. Move to approve the resolution savory comprehensive plan amendment. Um, file number CPA 0002-2019. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Roll call, please. Wilhelm? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Porters? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And the second resolution. Move to approve the endorsement of the City of Post Falls pre treatment program. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Roll call, please. Malloy? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Porters? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Next item up is administrative and staff reports. We're getting an update on the com new community events in Post Falls Parks. Brian. Perfect timing. Yeah, your timing is perfect, folks. <laughs> 
Good evening, Mayor Council. Once again, uh, Brian Myers, Parks Manager, City of Post Falls. Uh, just wanted to take one moment to give a report or a, a, an announcement of our upcoming public input for our Park and Rec Master Plan. Uh, this coming Monday, the 21st, we'll have a public open house uh, down at the trailhead, um, providing chili as well, and bring food. So folks will show up and provide some input on what they want to see our department doing over the over the next five to ten years. Uh, that that meeting is our findings and visioning. So we've had a, a number of public outreach components that have happened up till this point, including a citizen survey. Our consultants will be presenting what they've found so far and testing that with the community to make sure they're hearing correctly. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we've got uh, two different touch points. Um, two that are touching on our focus group or, or our areas of focus, a downtown civic space, and then uh, our community center. Uh, those meetings are at four o'clock and six o'clock respectively. There'll be notifications out on Facebook and, and uh, press release and the like. Um, those items, you know, we're, want, we're wanting to get initial feedback on, on where we're headed with those directions. So um, from there, uh, new community events that we've had in Post Falls Parks this past year. Uh, we started off the season in a rainy May, but uh, had a very successful, very well attended downtown for a day event. Uh, Tullamore Park dedication, uh, Live After Five summer concert series. We dedicated a park out at Crown Point. Uh, and then we had a water launcher festival at the end of the year. And then also touch base just a little bit on some of our annual events and, and kind of give an idea of, of some six, six successes we had there. Uh, downtown for a day uh, started out, you know, this it was a kind of a sketch of where we were started out and the vision we had overall of, of where we were headed uh, with that event. Took a lot of, a lot of folks, um, you know, a lot of folks throughout the whole community, throughout our whole, whole city, uh, city staff pitched in to make this happen. Uh, a willing property owner allowed, allowed <coughs> us to, to utilize the space. City staff uh, erecting the, the infrastructure necessary to support that event. And then a downtown activated for a day. Um, really, really uh, remarkable the number of folks that circulated in and out and throughout that event throughout the day. Um, vendor feedback was great. Public feedback was great. Um, we all would have liked a little more food and we would all would have liked a little more sun. But other than that, uh, very well received. And uh, kind of foreshadowing what, what's coming, uh, we've selected a couple of dates, uh, May 15th and 16th. It'll move to a two-day uh, two event for <coughs> Friday, Saturday uh, this coming year. Tillamore Park dedication happened on June 21st. Um, wonderful event, great, very well attended by the community. Um, but I had to highlight the man that really had uh, his hands in every phase of that. Mike Zimmerman, and I'm sure his wife bore a, a fair bit of that struggle as well uh, to bring that to completion. So, And then the, the recreation staff that really made that a, an event for the whole neighborhood. Um, you know, from bringing the bounce of house out and allowing some alternative play environments out there to scheduling the, the movie in the park with the PD and bringing pizza out to make that happen and, and really make it a, uh, a draw for the whole neighborhood and something special. Uh, great, well-attended event. Well, we, we saw the space get activated the way it was designed to, from the Andocus concert in the, in the amphitheater to the playground being used um, and, and the like. So. Live After Five, the summer concert series that we hosted at Tullamore Park, um, operated from the Thursday following that dedication on through the rest of the summer. He ran eight events this past summer uh, as outlined in the contract for that. Uh, that contract was a three-year contract uh, with an option for one three-year extension. Um, their setup didn't start until probably 11 o'clock each day, uh, rel relatively quick set up 11 to 12 and they were up and running by ready to be running at 4 30. event started at 5 regularly um, their cleanup was complete on a routine basis by 9 30 
Uh, we didn't get held late with staff throughout the whole event. Um, we did allow them to leave their stage sitting up on the on the bluff for the stage location until the following day to remove it. It was just safer to do that for our facility and there was no real push to have to have it out for that, that evening. Um, it was easier for me to bring staff in the next day than have to hang around till 10 o'clock or 10.30 for a tow truck driver to show up to haul that stage off. Um, KCFR came out and walked the facility the first, first week and they were, they were happy with the setup, had no issues with any of the vendors that I had heard. Um, and then other than that, uh, this, this overhead shows a picture of what that event looked like, the first setup. Um, this was a, a picture that we grabbed off of our Facebook page that uh, an individual shared with the city and, and the event promoter uh, of what the space looked like all set up. Public feedback for the event, um, I shared a couple, of, a handful of Facebook messages uh, that were in your council packet, so you could review those if you so choose. Uh, but generally, uh, online, through Facebook, social media outlets, the overall feedback was positive. Um, they enjoyed the variety of music that the promoter was able to bring. They enjoyed um, having the, the access close in uh, into their neighborhood and not having to make the drive into Coeur d'Alene. You know, um, comments like well, well organized, um, great venue. Uh, a number of the artists really enjoyed the venue. Uh, they got blasted by the sun in the late evening, but definitely enjoyed the venue. Um, you know, one, one concern online, this, this was about the bulk of our, our concerns we received on Facebook was you know, where are people going to park? And we had uh, in your council packet, we did a research on whether or not we had any calls for calls for complaint to the police department, and we received zero complaints related to parking uh, associated with the event. Attendance at the event, uh, total attendance for the year, 4,338 people. Um, this doesn't include staff associated with their, their, the event promoter or staff associated with any of the vendors. Uh, weekly average of 542. Uh, most attended at event was 830 people. That was on uh, the second show, I believe it was, this, uh, July 18th. Least attended event was 278. Um, that was the last event of the year. And weather was starting to turn a little bit at that point. But, uh, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention that we did have a few issues here and there throughout the event. Uh, the PD did receive two anonymous calls uh, related to noise. We did have one email string that was received by city staff and city staff interacted with one individual. And uh, that individual has asked us to play an audio from his residence um, a couple houses away. So we'll, we'll play that here in a moment. And there was one email received by the event promoter. I should mention that the email string uh, received by staff was received on the 22nd or 23rd, somewhere in that neighborhood. So there was only one, uh, one um, concert remaining for the season. We had slated to uh, measure at the little neighborhood community park that's uh, right across the street from his residence. Um, that was missed, so that, that, that is on me and my staff for not, not arranging for that to happen. But we did document the, the sound levels at our property line, we just didn't, didn't make it into the neighborhood like we had, we had planned to. The email to the event promoter was received the day after the last show of the year, um, and the general consensus on that was that they had a young child and it was bedtime right there towards the end of the show and they'd appreciate if it was just a little bit quieter, but they were overall positive of having the event in the neighborhood and in the community. Um, <clears throat> and kind of bringing that forward and, and making Tyler, Tyler Davis, the, the event promoter, uh, aware of these, these occurrences and, and the concerns that were being raised by a few of the neighbors. Uh, he stated that his goal is not to be a nuisance to the neighborhood or the community and he's open to discussing modifications um, to find some common ground there. So with that, let's see if I, this is me learning new tricks here, see how it goes.
You're not expecting me to dance, right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> so with that, um, you know, we we don't know where the where exactly it was taken, whether or not how how it was captured. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to take a sound level measurement along with that audio. That would have been the best case scenario, and we'll work on doing that in the coming coming season. You couldn't tell what the volume, if the volume was turned up during the playback or not, so yeah, you'd have to measure it at the time. We, we, we measured it, we, we ran it all, all the way up um, before, we, before we started, so. Did he say he was in his house? When yes. He, oh. Yeah, so that was in, in his house with windows open. Oh. Okay. And if I zoom back here, you can't quite see the neighborhood park um, in this overhead so the neighborhood park sits a block back from from that next intersection or that next crossroad that you see there so we're three roads over um, from the park so that sound definitely travels in a unique way there's there's no doubt about it and that's why we put those uh, or moved to put those <coughs> terms in the contract to allow for measurement at that nearest residential re residence um, at a point of complaint we did measure sound levels at that property corner. Um, so this is the property corner due west of the stage uh, where the asphalt trail meets the sidewalk along Charleville Road at 5 p.m. Uh, measurement at 68.2, uh, low average of 62.1. We peaked out uh, for this show at a seven o'clock measurement, a high measurement of 74 and a low average of 70. Um, this morning I had staff go out with the same tool that measures and just ambient sound in the neighborhood was at 63 and this was about 11 o'clock this morning um, and they had two trucks that drove by while they were measuring and those both peaked out at 72.8. What's our limit? Did we set a limit? 80 at that point is our, is our limit in the contract. Uh, 95 at the sound mixer. Um, and then at nearest residential complaint, I'd have to go through the contract and reference that because we, we haven't been actively measuring at that location, so I haven't committed that to memory. Um, Crown Point Park dedication. No, this happened the last day of summer. So Tullamore was first day of summer. This was on the last day of summer. Um, once again, I'm very well attended. I just wanted to kind of show some of the progression of Crown Point Park as we moved to dedication. The picture on the top up here is actually the earliest photo and then as snow moved in we started erecting the, the playground and then we were presented with uh, an early February morning finding our shelter uh, not standing anymore. So staff responded well and uh, we worked with the builders to, to rectify that issue and, and make that, those corrections. Um, Crown Point was a fight for us to get to get to completion this summer and, and make that ready for the public. Um, but staff did a wonderful job of, of making all, all the modifications that were needed and, and bringing that to completion. And, um, you know, people are out there enjoying that, that facility. Uh, the dedication up there, we brought in a petting zoo and uh, some ice cream and the neighborhood definitely came out and in droves. Uh, Tracy. It hit the nail on the head with this one to, to really find a good fit for the theme that we had with that neighborhood park. Um, and it was well received. Uh, Water Lantern Festival. Uh, this happened first weekend of September and um, unique, unique event for us and an opportunity to celebrate the river. Um, they delivered on everything that they said they were going to. Uh, I know a couple a couple of folks one day we visited while you were down there and uh, the the ambiance and and the the messaging that happened this happened just about, happened to be on the same day as uh, suicide prevention awareness day and there was a fun run in Coeur d'Alene and there were a number of folks that participated in that fun run and then came and joined this event in the afternoon and uh, to hear those stories shared, they had an opportunity at the at the DJ at the mic to to talk through the story of what they were there, what they were there celebrating, whether it was lost loved ones or or near misses or otherwise. Um, 
you know, celebrations of anniversaries. There, there were just a whole gamut of things that were shared. Uh, I talked with one couple that came down uh, from Colville to attend the event. Um, we did get some data from, from the, the promoter and there were something like 128 unique zip codes uh, <coughs> covering a big part of the region. Coeur d'Alene was the largest single zip code hit, uh, Post Falls being second. Um, Post Falls had well over 140 folks that, that attended the event. Uh, Coeur d'Alene was probably in that 150, 160 range. Um, not including folks that have a PO box somewhere else that ends up on a different zip. But uh, all in all, from a staff's perspective, uh, pretty low inputs. Uh, we were somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 40 to 50 man hours associated with this event. The one little hiccup we had is we were doing a seal coat project the week before and the weather didn't cooperate. So we had a morning that was a little bit crazy trying to get stripes back on the parking lot before the event happened. Uh, but our contractor pulled through and showed up at 4.30 in the morning and, and we were able to have the facility ready for the event. A uh, couple of pictures of, of what it looked like uh, throughout the day. Um, you know, great, great, great attendance, 1,100 people for a first year event, uh, big regional draw, and you know, it's one of those things that parks play, play an input on bringing new money into the community, bringing new, new dollars that otherwise would be spent somewhere else, and, and this is a way we do that. Uh, overall annual events, we, we still carried a number of events, so just kind of touch on a few of them. Annual tree giveaway, we boosted the number of trees this year. We had more trees that we handed out than any, any other year. We had a, a partnership this year with the City of Rathrum, uh, which was new for us. Uh, Post Falls vendors, uh, Post Falls Festival, our vendors were up from previous years, both in our one-day craft and our, and our full three-day show. Um, Post Falls Triathlon, once again, growing and uh, very well attended um, very well received by by those user groups and then shoes and brews that just happened uh, two weekends ago uh, 200 plus participants so our largest year there once again so folks are coming out people are enjoying our our, our events that we sponsor and also those events that that out others are are running in our spaces so with that i'd stand for any questions you may have i want to thank you and the entire Park and Rec staff, I think you guys do a tremendous job. Uh, we hear nothing but, well, well, I won't say nothing. We do hear a few complaints, <laughs> but the majority of them are very positive. Uh, I love the fact that you're offering new events, and obviously looking at the numbers, the success of those events are very good. So uh, keep up the good work. It was fun to finally get Tullamore Park open, finally. Uh, long perseverance on your parts. Appreciate that. And appreciate your effort on getting Crown Point to where it needed to be to get that open. So. Uh, again, nice job. Tullamore Park, I came in on the later stages of that. That was a labor of love of yours and Dave's for much longer than, than myself, for sure. I don't think I had hair, but I, like <laughs> said, I may have had some. So. <laughs> Any comments? I'd just like to say that, you know, especially on the uh, live after five, I was a little bit skeptical about that because of the noise possibility and the parking. And you guys just really made it happen, made it happen right. I know there were a couple of complaints there about the noise, but uh, I went down there and I talked to some of the people in the neighborhood and then just reading through the, uh, the comments, really turned out to be an awesome, awesome event. I think that's a, you found the right person to partner with and, and <coughs> held them accountable and they put on a great event. And so many people talking about what it's all about, bringing the neighborhood together, meeting their neighbors, hanging out, I just think you guys did an awesome job. Thanks again, Brad. Appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Next item up, mayor comments and our friends from uh, <coughs> the uh, Safe Infant Sleep Awareness folks are showed up, and I believe you just left Coeur d'Alene, as I recall. So Liz Montgomery and her crew. Safe Infant Sleep Awareness Month 2019. Whereas sudden unexpected infant death, SUID, is, is the sudden and unexpected death of an infant birth to age one year in which the manner and cause of death are not immediately obvious prior to investigation. And whereas sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, is a subset of SUID and remains a leading cause of infant death between the ages of 28 days to one year. 
And whereas the tragedy of Seward can happen to any family regardless of race, ethnicity, or economic status, and whereas evidence-based research has proven that when babies are placed in a crib alone in the parent's room, on their backs on a firm crib mattress with a fitted crib sheet, and in a smoke-free env environment using no crib bumper pads, pillows, blankets, quilts, or stuffed animals and toys, they will sleep safer with a reduced risk of SIDS and other causes of infant deaths. And whereas Inland Northwest SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Services, Inc., is a statewide, not-for-profit organization dedicated to providing infant sleep education, bereavement support services, and community awareness about how to prevent sleep-related infant deaths. And whereas during the month of October, the Inland Northwest SIDS Foundation, Inc., will hold special events including Run for the Angels and, dis and, and a distribution of safe infant sleep educational pamphlets, cribs and wearable blankets to family in need, therefore providing the best opportunity for all babies in Idaho to survive and thrive. Now therefore I, Ronald G. Jacobson, Mayor of the City of Post Falls, Idaho, do hereby proclaim October 2019 a Safe Infant Sleep Awareness Month in Post Falls, Idaho in order to raise awareness about preventing sleep-related infant deaths and to encourage safe infant sleep practices so that no parent will have to endure the tragedy of the death of a baby dated this 15th day of October, 2019. And if any of you have not had the opportunity to meet Liz Montgomery and her, her crew, uh, you're missing a wonderful opportunity. It's, uh, the, the amount of work that these folks have done is tremendous. Uh, you've reached out to how many different counties now? I mean, throughout, throughout the state. Everybody. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and do you have, a, do you want to make a comment, Liz, or are you okay? <laughs> I'm going to use mayoral privileges and let Liz come forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so thank you for um, taking the time out and being flexible with us today. Uh, there were some interesting public comments that Spokane, or I mean Coeur d'Alene City Council tonight. Uh, they're passing the Iron Man or hopefully passing Iron Man, so it took a lot longer than we expected. Um, sudden unexpected infant death kills more children in the U.S. than opioids, guns, and suicide combined. In 2017, just last year, 3,600 infants died from sudden unexpected infant death. It is the number one cause of death of our infants age one month to 12 months of age. We know from the CDC that 90% of these deaths were preventable, accidental sleep-related deaths, and we know that over half of these deaths occur while an infant is sleeping with a parent or another caregiver sharing a sleep surface. According to Idaho, Vital, uh, Idaho State Vital Statistics Health District 1, which is um, our health district, um, we have the second highest sewage rates in the state of Idaho. For every 100,000 infants born in Health District 1, 131 will die from sudden unexpected infant death compared to 87 infants per 100,000 live births in the state of Idaho. In Kootenai County, approximately three infants die every year from sudden unexpected infant death. Three children who will not celebrate their first birthday, three children who will not visit the Cataldo Mission on their fourth grade Idaho history tour, three children who will not graduate from Post Falls High School. Three devastated families who will continue to live their lives with broken hearts. I'm Liz Montgomery, Executive Director of Inland Northwest SIDS Foundation. It's an honor to be here today to witness um, the reading and signing of a proclamation by Mayor Jacobson that will bring awareness to sudden infant death and the immediate and vital need for safe sleep education for our families in Post Falls and for anyone caring for an infant. We are the only nonprofit serving Post Falls who provides awareness, education, and support to families in our community. We pride ourselves in spearheading this proclamation in hopes to eliminate preventable sleep-related infant deaths in Post Falls infants and to bring awareness to the need for bereavement support for our families affected by sudden infant death. As many of you know, I'm not only the director of Inland Northwest SIDS Foundation, I'm the mom of two children, my daughter Holly and my son Mason. 
<laughs> who died in 2003 from a sleep-related um, accidental death at five and a half months old. Uh, although his death was labeled SIDS at the time, um, we know that um, that was the term that we used for all of our infant deaths back then, really, um, that we didn't know a, a cause of. Um, so now we know our safe infant sleep recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics that came out in 2012. And so um, we know that babies sleep safest alone on their backs in their own crib, free of blankets, pillows, and toys. Um, thank you, Post Falls City Council, Chief Knight, for in Kootenai County Fire and Rescue for your support. Um, I know I've trained all of your staff from, with my medical director, Dr. Webb, and we can't tell you how much your support, your encouraging words, your donations, your volunteer time to our foundation means and how it impacts um, our mission and the work that we do here in Post Falls. So together, uh, where we work as a community to um, continue our education and to um, support our families who've suffered the death of an infant um, for, um, through signing this proclamation and bringing awareness. So thank you very much and thank you to our community um, for all of your support. Thanks, Liz. And the work you've done is, is absolutely amazing. And you say the, you know, you've helped in Post Falls, but you've helped not only in Post Falls, but all of Kootenai County and the state of Idaho. State of Idaho. And uh, the work you do is truly commendable. So thank you very much. Mm, thank you. And thank you for taking the time to rush out here. Uh, to be here for the proclamation, I'm sure there were no speed limits broken, so <laughs> if there were, Chief will give you a free pass. Uh, are there any council comments tonight? No. I'd just like to add that um, my wife and I raised five kids. We made all those mistakes, all the things we learned from Liz. We now have five grandchildren and numerous nieces and nephews who have all heard the message because having somebody like that in our community who will share that and uh, they're all safe, so thank you, Liz. It's one of those where, as you, we've gotten older and now we have grandkids, we realize mm -hmm. how, when they tell us we were wrong, they're writing telling us we were wrong, so that's, that's one time we can let our kids correct us. So, any other council comments? No executive session tonight? None tonight, sir. The next motion is? Adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We need adjourn, thank you. <laughs>